Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Read and Reaction podcast. We'd like to welcome Coach Kevin Kelly to this episode. Uh, Coach is known as the coach who never punts, a nine-time Arkansas State champ and 18 seasons as the head coach of Pulaski Academy in Little Rock. Kelly made waves across the college football world last season when he took the head coaching position at Presbyterian College. We'll ask Coach Kelly what he learned from his college experience at all, all being around the college game and everything. And uh, we're looking forward to diving into the college, into the conversation here. But coach, we want to first welcome you to the show. Oh, appreciate it. I uh, appreciate what you guys do and just entertainment about football is always a good thing. So I appreciate you guys. Well, let, let's, let's dive right into your experience at Presbyterian. That's obviously a big move to make. You had been there. I, I watched an old interview with you uh, from last summer where you, you talked about you, you your top guy uh, that you've been working with at Pulaski Academy for a while came in and said, Hey coach, nine titles in 18 seasons. What are we going to do next for a challenge? And so you had been open to the opportunity. You said you had interviewed at a few more places, but what, what caused you to want to make that jump at, at that moment? Uh, and especially too, in the COVID environment, I know it wasn't as tough as that 2020 season, but still there were still some restrictions and everything. That's a, that was a tough time to jump into the college ranks, wasn't it? Yeah, it really was. I mean, you, you said it exactly correctly. And, you know, sometimes you get your emotions get the best of you. I was at a great place and, and, you know, had done a lot, had good people around me. And I guess the right time a man decides I want a challenge or I want a new challenge or something like that. And, and, uh, and, you know, my wife's fantastic about those kinds of things. And, and, and so we discussed it and, you know, honestly, it was a tough time to do it, you know, right then during COVID. And I didn't realize, you know, in Arkansas, we were headed in the right direction. We were headed back to normalcy way more than probably most states were. And I got there and it was a little difficult and they were still battling some of the things that I despised battling. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it was, it was a tough time to move, but overall I wanted a challenge, wanted something uh you know let me just just something different i guess and well coach i mean florida obviously is transitioning to having billy napier in charge there um and so you come in and coming into this program obviously from the high school ranks to the college ranks but you know what are you doing or what are you trying to establish during spring practice when you come in new players you don't know them you're trying to establish relationships what are you focusing on in spring practice and how are you trying to get that to transition then over into the fall when you're trying to really sort of get your system installed and also build relationships with the players on your squad i didn't get hired until june 7th so I didn't have spring practice if i had been doing spring practice i mean that's what i would want to do is i would want to run a bunch of plays get our system in on offense and defense and just you know like most coaches would say reps 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 to, to so they're at least familiar with the what and the why of what we're trying to do and coach, I mean, I guess sort of going to the other side of your experience, obviously spent a lot of time in high school. You, you had big time guys who wound up in the NFL and guys who wound up in college there coming from Pulaski. You know, how much influence do you have as the head coach? How much contact do you have with the head coach from these big schools who, when they're coming in to recruit one of your players? You know, somebody from LSU is coming in or somebody from even Arkansas, or Arkansas State's coming in. How much contact do you have? How important is it for the coach to set up a relationship with you as opposed to just with the players? I think there's some of both of what you just said. And what I mean by that is, and I did take that to college with me. I wanted to go out and establish relationships with some high school coaches because I wanted to be able to trust them to call them and say, hey, do you have any players I would want, you know, and, and get to know my system, get to know me, get to know my culture. From the same token, when I was in high school, you know, I developed relationships over the years where if I call, if I pick up the phone and call certain coaches and said, I got a guy that you'll like, he fits with what you do, your culture. I wanted him to be able to trust me. I think that's a good thing. Uh, other times, you know, I mean, it's nowadays with social media and so much technology, it's rare that they miss the opportunity to get a kid that, that they think is a division one kid or, or whatever level they're trying to recruit accordingly. Uh, just because it's everything's so out there at your fingertips. I mean, you can be a coach in college sitting in an airport somewhere and you're looking at film of kids to see if it's somebody you want to call and ask about. I think, I think a kid getting their film out there, you know, getting, getting in contact with a coach via social media and getting them to take a look at his film on his own, they can do a lot of damage themselves with that. I mean, good damage. They can get their name in front of somebody. At the same time, I think it's good if a coach built a relationship where he can pick up the phone and call and say, hey, take a look at my guy. I, I wouldn't call you if I didn't think he was 
uh, somebody you might want because that credibility you have with college coaches is significant because they've got so many guys they've got looking at. They can't waste their time. They've got to be efficient with their time. So they need to be able to trust the high school coach to give them good advice. Now the film, the film is evident is are most of those conversations behind the scenes more about character attitude and, and maybe academics. A hundred percent. They are. And because, you know, honestly, let, let's, let's look at the top 10 running backs in the country. Let's say you're a Florida, you're an Alabama, you're a Clemson, and you're looking for a running back and you want one of the top 10 in the country. Is there a big difference between two and four? Probably not. Is there a difference between six and seven and six and nine? I mean, there's not a ton. It's going to be development. So that's where you go and talk to the high school coach. Tell them about the kid's character. Tell them about his leadership. They want leaders. You know, am I going to worry about the kid off the field at all? That's another place you want to be able to trust the high school coach. I wanted them to be able to trust me. So if I said, hey, you know, the kid's a, a, a kid's a great kid. You're going to love him. You don't have to worry about him off the field. Other kids, you know, if you didn't, they get the sign. You hate to say it, but you got to be honest because you don't want to run your credibility for the kids forward. But you're just like, oh, look, you know, you got a little bit of work to do there. I think he's got the potential to be an awesome kid, but you need them to be able to trust you. But yes, absolutely. If you've got a kid that is a good athlete nowadays, but doesn't have great character or a coach is just worried about having to spend time with them, they have to spend so much time with boosters and with raising money and with you know, research and scholarship and the X's and O's, they don't have time to mess with a young man that's not ready, mature enough to go to school, go to class like he's supposed to without us prodding him along. And, and from both sides of that, uh, that's why I think if a kid thinks, I want to go play college ball, you know, he needs, it's important. Some kids are like, I don't care what anybody thinks about me. You need to care what your high school coach thinks if you're going to play college ball because he's going to factor in on a big time. Well, I mean, so conversely, though, I mean, you talked a lot about having the colleges trust you at the high school level for your opinion. But what about the other direction? So, you know, what do you think the worst thing a college head head coach can do when he comes into a school recruiting one of your players? Is it, you know, it, it I'm sure you've seen all sorts of types come in. Is there some is there a quality specifically that strikes there that strikes out to you as something that you just sort of looked at and turned you off or or even turn your players off? Yeah, you know, I, I think when a, when a college coach comes in. Most high school coaches love it if they look them in the eye and they visit with them for a few minutes. I mean, we know, you know, again, being on both sides of this, I know they've got places to go, people to see, and they need to be efficient with their time. But while you're there, a high school coach wants you to look them in the eye and talk to them, whether it's five minutes, 15 minutes, or however long you're there. They don't want to make them phone calls while they're there. You know, you're supposed to be talking to me about my kid. And you don't have to, but it's just proper and it's courtesy and that kind of stuff. And that leaves a good taste in a high school coach's mouth. The other thing that I think is very important is, is that they have the courtesy to call you. A lot of coaches are teaching classes in high school of some kind. And if they call you in the night before, if they have somebody call you, say, hey, I'm going to be there at 9 a.m. tomorrow or be there at noon tomorrow. Can you visit with me? And that's important, too. That's a courtesy level like you respect my time, like I'm trying to respect your time. And I think those two things are probably the most important. And then take a few questions from the coach. Let them ask you, hey, what's it like to be you? Give me what your Monday look like. You know, take a few minutes to entertain the questions he wants to answer. High school coaches love that kind of stuff. Now, now coach, one, one of the parts here with you digging into recruiting, you're an analytics guy. You come up with efficiencies where they haven't really existed. You, you, you're willing to test out new ideas in the idea in the in the world of football here. It's gotten you on the map for sure. What nugget out there, without giving away the secret recipe, I guess, but looking into the recruiting world, were you able to pick up one or two factors that maybe a lot of people don't pay attention to in the recruiting world that <laughs> seem to help identify better players? Were you able to pick up on some trends that where if you maybe you did have the scholarship to offer, you, you might have a leg up on the competition? You know, I got, I got a different viewpoint uh, from there, but I think the better viewpoint would be for me at my high school, we averaged about one FBS kid a year mm -hmm. or maybe 1.1, 1.2 kids a year. I got a better approach from looking at other high schools and, and you get to know them and you play them in seven on seven in Arkansas in the summer. We go all over the country and play. And, and I got a better approach in that. And when I watch kids and I the coach, you know, and I knew that was an, a big time kid, I like to watch how he acts around the other kids. You know, if he's one of them and not a big timer, and you know what I mean, you know, where he walks out there and he knows he's big time, 
because that's going to crash all around him when he gets to college because he's not the big timer anymore. They're all big timers. You know, they were all the best in their conference and, and one of the best in the state. So I like to see a kid that's a normal kid and trying to fit in because that's what he needs to do when he gets to his team in college is fit in. In, <coughs> excuse me, in college football, I think the number that signed Division One, FBS, uh, that sign at a college and finish at that college playing football and graduate is around 20%, 20%. So, you know, there's a million, and that was two years ago before the portal opened up and you could get a transfer in and all this crazy stuff and get a free transfer and all this. And I guess my point is we've got an 80% problem there in my opinion. So we're wrong four out of five times. We're only right one out of five. And there's so many things. I don't mean we're right, but I mean, Somehow it doesn't mesh up. To me, the number one thing is look for a kid that wants to fit in and and understands. And I think there needs to be a little more two-way honesty. And what I mean by that is tell the kid, look, I'm not promising you're going to get to play. What I'm promising you is you're going to get a chance to play. You're going to get a chance to come in, work, and prove that you're good enough to play for us to win a spot. And uh, then at least they know what they're getting into and they're not disappointed. If you – you know, lead a kid to believe he's going to come right in and start for you. You're so good. You're the man, you know, can't wait to see you in that red starting that first day. And he doesn't all of a sudden he's not happy and he's surprised he wasn't ready for that. And what's he going to do? He's going to transfer a semester at the end of the year. And, and I think that's the, the, the thing in high school that the kids probably want to hear that the coaches in the college don't think they want to hear. They think they want to hear how great they are and how we're going to make you a superstar. I think everybody just wants the truth. You know, I, I, I know I want that if I walk up and I'm buying a car. I want the guy to tell me the truth. I mean, you know, I don't want to drive it off the lot and find out that it's, bro, I'm going to go up there and cause some trouble. And, and, and I think it's the same way in so many things. There's nothing, there's no substitute for two things on the earth, hard work and honesty. And I think everybody needs to be honest about it. And, and I think people, I took that approach. I was pretty pleased with that part of the recruiting. I just promised a kid one thing. I'm going to give you a chance to show me what you can do. Now, it's up to you to do that. All you can ask for is the chance. And uh, people appreciated that. So, I mean, you know, you talked about big timers and in big time college football, now we've got name, image, and likeness sort of changing the landscape. And so, you know, I guess there's two questions there. One is, you know, with the changing landscape, with money essentially changing hands to not, I guess, legally not to get these guys to commit, but let's be honest, there's a wink, wink that you're going to commit to this place if you get the NIL. And then also, you know, so there's that aspect of it. How do you sort of think that these coaches are going to have to deal with the cohesiveness that you need with a team where you don't have the big timers, but you got some guy over here making 4 million bucks. And then also, is there a way to use that to gain a competitive advantage from a big time program perspective? Like, is there something you would do using NIL at a big time program? Do you think to, to gain an advantage over your competition? Well, I mean, I think those advantages are already setting up. If you've got, you know, I mean, you, you know, you guys know the University of Texas. Everybody's heard that if you're a if you're a scholarship offensive lineman, you're getting fifty thousand a year. Mm -hmm. You know, right then and there, if you've got alumni base with a lot of money, uh, you've got an advantage. Especially if you've got somebody that's organized them and got them together and said, okay, everybody throw it in this pot and here's how we're going to distribute this. Those kinds of things. I, you know, the the part the, when I get why the NCAA pulled their name when they lost that when they lost that, that, that uh, court case that went, I think, all the way up to the Supreme Court, and they just threw their hands back and said, okay, NIL, and we're not touching this. They had to because uh, – for a couple of reasons. One, it took uh, Title IX out of it. I mean, as soon as the colleges – as soon as the NCAA said, colleges, do not jack with the NIL. Let the player and the, and the businesses or whoever's doing that – when they backed out of it, now Title IX, they didn't have to have the same number of NIL money for women and men because that's, that wasn't going to be the same because what sport pays the bills, football does, and that's where the NIL money is going to come in and, and all that kind of stuff. So they backed out for that. The other thing they backed out for is, is if colleges were involved in NIL and you and I want Steve Smith over here to come in and play quarterback, and we're like, hey, college, we're going to give you $100,000 to get him in, and you give him the NIL money, well, what happens when you, you know, you promise that kid on August the 1st, he's going to get that check and you and I don't pay the college. Is the college going to still pay him? Or are they going to come after us for the money? They want to know part of that. Now, the reason I said all that to mention is we all know this was what happens. 
the Clemsons, the Texases, the Alabamas that have some money in the deep pockets, how much more did they separate themselves from the mid-majors that had a chance uh, over the years to make it? When you look at your central, your UCFs, I think they got separated. You know, we were always pulling for that one mid-major to make the playoffs, you know, a Cincinnati or whatever. I think as you go along through the next few years, you're going to see it separated more and more where those guys aren't even a possibility because the disparagement of talent for NIO money comes to play a little bit more from the bigger colleges that have more graduates, more boosters, you know, all those kinds of things that you can make more money at those places. Now, how about, an, how about there's a mid-major with a multi-billionaire that's willing to carry the sack for everybody? You know, let's say, uh, let's say Warren Buffett graduated from um, Butler. All of a sudden, the world changed for Butler. You know, if he's willing to go all in and go, you know, I'm going to give out 20 million a year to NIL guys. So All Kevin Kelly, the, the, the world changes. The world changes. You know what so, I'm saying? So Coach Kelly's predicting a national championship for Oregon sometime in the not too distant future. Is what that I, sounds I, like. <laughs> I'm saying you've still got a coach, but you know you're going to have the better players. And right now, I, I'll bet, I'll bet you that Alabama wasn't happy about this because they were the ones getting the best players. Agreed. Oh yeah, they're, pretty they're much. Probably... And, it's You're like Jimbo the, called it the, the under the table NIL deals, right? <laughs> well, I, I'm, you know, that's not for me to say, but you know, you look at them and now all of a sudden they're like, whoever was getting the best players year after year. Now the other teams have a chance to get the best players year after year. So guys like that aren't happy about NIL. Maybe if you weren't, but you know, we're going to be big time NIL players. Now all of a sudden you've got a chance. You're probably happy about that deal, but I'll guarantee you this. All coaches are worried about a just, a disparagement amongst their own team and what they're making. Your quarterback's making this, your receiver's not making much of anything, or your safety. I mean, you know, who's going to get more, your safety or quarterback? In the NFL, it's a business. In college, these guys aren't old enough to figure that out, and they've got 55 guys trying to tell them, hey, look, how come he's getting that and you're not getting that? You know, they've still got to have defense. I mean, now you've got to manage that as a player, and it's way different than it is in the NFL because the NFL – it's a business. Everybody knows it. They're signing the contract. They know what they're getting into. And if you're not going to behave and you're not going to act like a team player, they'll cut you and get somebody that goes, it didn't work like that in college. So I personally, you know, I think there was a better way to do it. I, but I, I get the NCAA didn't want to do it. There's a couple of ways to do it. Number one is you could go, okay, here's what we're going to do. What we're going to do is we're going to, uh, every player is going to get paid. Let's take the state with the highest minimum wage. Let's say it's 15 bucks an hour. You're all working, you know, basically you're working 40 hours a week. You're going to get paid $600 a week, minimum wage, at the end of the week. Well, they're already on scholarship. Room and board's paid for. That's $600 a week, free money. Mm. And everybody's the same in college. The NCAA is going to help subsidize that, whether you're at Toledo or whether you're at Alabama. And there's plenty of money for them to do that with. And everybody's on the same page. Now, all of a sudden, they are getting paid for their work. Supreme Court thing, people feel kind of, you know, and, and, we're, and we're good to go. The other thing they could do it is, is on an incentive-laden program like, like okay, we're going to give you half of your money now in the world of, uh, of, of minimum wage or however you want to do it or jersey sales for your team or whatever. But the other half is going to be if you graduate. Then you get a lump sum. Now, all of a sudden, everybody has an incentive to stay in school a little bit longer, get that education. Because, I mean, the number still in the NFL – you go to the NFL, I think the number's like a 92% of them file bankruptcy before it's over with. 92%. That's insane. And so we need to still incentivize them to stay in school so they have an education, they have a degree, and if the NFL thing didn't work out, they can go on and get an education. So I think there was a lot of ways to do it. And I'm not saying that would have been easier. I'm not on that side having to do all the logistics of that. But Man, the way it is now, I don't think it's going to end up being a good thing for anybody. Or it, it won't be a good thing for the majority of people, and that includes coaches and the vast, vast number of players. Well, to, and to your point, Coach, it is a little bit of the Wild West still. It's, that, it's definitely going to evolve. We're going to, definitely going to see some evolution. So I, I certainly like a couple of the ideas you pitched there. I, I haven't heard much of that out there. Look – Will is our analytics guy, Coach, and he's going to kill me if I don't allow him to ask the analytics questions for you. We've I've interviewed okay. you before. Like A lot of people have seen interviews with you where you talk about the not punting on fourth down, which, by the way, very popular now. We're seeing that 
grow ever increase it. So that's my one analytics question for you that I'm going to do before I turn over the analytics section here to Will. What's it like seeing, you know, Lane Kiffin's out there going for fourth down after fourth down. The NFL's doing it a ton. What's that like to see that argument kind of swing to something you've been preaching for the last decade and a half? Well, you know, if I stay in football, I don't want to see it. And I say all that to say because I had the advantage, you know, I had a distinct advantage. I feel like that. And if I, if I don't go back into football and I'm trying to figure out what I want to do, if I want to go into business and start actually making some real money, you know, and, and, and not capping how much I can make by, by, by if I want to work a million hours a week. But if I don't, then I think it's pretty cool because, you know, I'll feel like I helped contribute to that. I was doing that before Moneyball came out. I was doing that before, uh, Sloan sports analytics was a thing I was doing that before analytics was a word that was even used in sports. And so I'll feel like I helped contribute to that because the reason that's important is because I think if you poll the average stadium, they like that brand of football. It's a more exciting brand of football. It's everybody wants to see less punny. That fourth down moment is an exciting moment in football. And, uh, you know, that kind of stuff and some of the other things we were doing, you know, because everybody knows about the punting and the onside kicking. And what they don't understand is we use analytics on our defense to, to make it better. It, it, it became more and throughout stuff we were working on that everybody thinks matters that we don't think mattered. And we use it to organize our offense and, and, and decide what our uh, our mission was going to be on offense and how we were going to do it to be more efficient and more effective. Because the bottom line is scoring points on that in that level. And we changed the game. Anybody that's went to one of our went to one of our games in high school will say they walk away. And I hear I heard it the other day. Somebody saw me on the street. He's like, "Hey, aren't you that guy?" I'm like, "Yeah." And he goes, uh, "Man, I went to one of your high school games. I flew in from D.C. just to watch your high school." And he goes, uh, "Well, I said, well, what'd you think?" He goes, "Never seen anything like it." And that's what they always have. Never seen anything like it. And so, football, I think, is the greatest sport in the world to play. And I just think there's so many things in there you can't learn anywhere else in life other than football about hard work and testing your body and commitment, dedication. So to make it more exciting usually means to make more people watch it. And that means more kids want to play it. So from the grassroots part, I know you don't want to hear the moral compass of that thing. From the grassroots part, I think football is a sport we need kids playing because I think life's tough. I think football is tough. I think there's all those life lessons you learn you can't get anywhere else. And uh, I think we're, one of the reasons we're the greatest, I, this is terrible for me to say, one of the reasons we're the greatest country in the world or have been, there's a small percent of that contributed by the game of football. Because the other thing it does is what brings, what in America brings more people together than any other event at one time? A dang Saturday or Sunday college football game where you can get 90,000 people rooting for a common cause, regardless of race, sex, gender, religion, politics, it doesn't matter. If me and you are going to a Florida game and you know I'm a Florida fan, I know you're a Florida fan, we're pulling for the same thing for that moment. I don't care if you're a Democrat, Republican, Baptist, Catholic. I mean, none of that matters, right? Football is the thing that we need to be exciting. We need to keep improving. So people want to watch it. People want to play it. And people want to go to it. Coach, you need Which to stay I, in football there. Come on, man. <laughs> Come on. Well, I actually wanted – so it's interesting you say – it's it's not that I don't care about it. I, I care about the analytics a lot. But one of the things I think is, is fascinating is everyone has known for years – that not punting is the right move on fourth down. The math, the people who have looked at the math have known for years. You're the one who was brave enough to do it. Right. And so I guess the question that I have for you when it comes to that is there's a difference between looking at an analytic and knowing it's the right thing to do and actually doing it. And so what is it that you think about, what is it about your background? What is it about just your, your attitude? What is it that made you say, I'm going to do this because I believe in it because it makes sense to heck with the risk that everyone else is worried about failing. I want to win. I'm going to, I'm going to take the advantages I can get. It's probably a few things really. One, I think there, I, I don't know that there's a, I don't know that you're born with this or not, but you might be. And that is the, the character, the trait of risk aversion. And there's two kinds of people in the world when it comes to the words risk aversion. There's those that look at, if I do this, what's the good that comes out of it? And then there's those, if I do this, what's the bad that's going to happen if it doesn't work, okay? 
And I tend to look at the what good's going to come out of it when most people look at, well, if it's fourth and three and we don't make it, what's going to happen? Well, they get the ball right there. They're close to our goal line. Crowd's going to boo, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and I think that's one. So, and I don't know if you're born with that or if it's evolved to that. I think two is the fact that I was born really, really poor and not with anything. First one in my family ever go to college, didn't have food at times growing up, all that kind of stuff. And I think I have the nothing to lose mentality as a result of that. You know, because if I revert back to where I was, you can't put me much worse than I've ever been before because I've been there before. Made it through that, I'd make it through it again. And that's, that. I think, so I think some of the upbringing is, is a big deal. And I think the third thing is, and I, I, I think that coaches at all levels struggle with this, and, and that is our number one priority as a coach when it comes to playing a football game itself should be, are you really willing to do everything and make every decision that's best for your team to win? I can't tell you many coaches I've talked to that say the answer to that question is no, I won't do everything at that moment because I've got too much to lose. Or if I get fired, my coaches lose their job. They've got too much to lose. And so the truth be known, they won't do everything that they think is the best decision to win they, at that moment. And, and that's where I try to actually do that, if at all possible. Because, you know, like I say, the worst thing that could happen is to get fired. And, you know, in the end, I'll make it work out. I'm a spiritual guy. God's going to make something work out for me. And my job is to give our guys that have worked all week, some of them all year, to give them the single best chance at that moment to win the football game. And if that means I've got to go for it, and if we don't make it, everybody's going to boo me, then that's what I'm going to do. And uh, I just think that, you know, that that's something that's lost these days because of social media, because of media, it's such a covered game. In the game of football, it's also because of an ego thing. You know, everybody, everybody knows that, uh, let's, let's take the Seattle Seahawks. Everybody knows who Pete Carroll is and everybody knows what his face looks like. And if he makes a bad decision, everybody sees him on a street or at a restaurant or in social media. But if the Seattle Mariners guy makes a bad decision analytically, do you know who that guy is? <laughs> I don't. He's not the face of the team like the coach is. With that face of the team comes more pressure not to, not, not to take risks and to play it safe, so to speak, if that makes sense. Absolutely. So from a football perspective, one of, one of the things I've been looking at recently is it used to be that when you tried to go downfield more often, that your completion percentage would go down, right? So as, as you're trying to get more yards per completion, your completion percentage would go down. The last five, six, seven years in college football, that's really started to separate where those are disconnected. There's a much higher completion percentage. You know, guys like Bryce Young are completing 70% of their passes, but they're still averaging eight, nine, 10 yards per attempt downfield. I mean, I have my ideas about why that might have happened, but I'm curious as in in you know, and most of the time those innovations happen at the high school level anyway. I'm curious as to what you think has changed on offense to sort of lead to that adaptation at the quarterback position. I honestly I think it's a few things. And, and one, I think coaches have gotten better. I think innovation's gotten innovation's gotten better. I think the more people that aren't scared to throw the ball the more people you've got that are willing to throw the ball down the field. And so naturally uh, coaching gets better in that area. Number two, the rules of the game have dictated that you can't just go across and kill a receiver across the middle. And since you can't do that, you know, since those rules have changed and you have to be careful how you hit receivers across the middle, coaches are less scared to call plays to throw the ball or design offenses in the middle because they know, okay, my kid's going to get up. They can't just pulverize the kid or decapitate the kid. At the same time, the kid's not as scared to go up and catch the ball over the middle. The quarterback's not as scared to throw in the middle. You know, quarterbacks don't want their receivers to get decapitated. And in the past, there was a level of I'm afraid to throw that ball because he might get decapitated. And he's going to come back to the huddle if he can get up and, and say, hey, what are you doing, trying to kill me? And so I think the rule changes. I think the evolution of the game and passing. And then I think analytics are certainly helping. We now know that chunk plays are a big part of winning the game, one of the biggest parts of winning the game. And how do you do that? Well, you do that by throwing routes that where a guy's not stationary and throwing it, you know, over the middle where the ball's in the air a shorter amount of time. Defense has less time to react and get to the ball so you get run after catch. So I think all those things factor in. And But I still think there is a ton of improvement. I think give it three or four more years, 
you'll see higher completion percentages and even higher yards per attempt as a result of, because we're still on the cusp of, the, of, of dealing with the current rule system where, they, where it's more difficult uh, to play defense and pass defense especially. So I think offensive coordinators and offenses are going to be designed and take more advantage of that. So one of the places that Billy Napier seems to have put a lot of his attention is on recruiting the safety position, safeties and corners, especially at least initially, that's where he seems to be putting his energy. But I'm wondering from a defensive perspective, when you can't, you know, crush somebody who comes over the middle, when you know guys are going to take shots downfield, how do you think defenses are going to change and adapt to try to at least mitigate that in some circumstances? I mean, it might end up looking like the big 12 from a decade ago or, you know, it's 70 to 63, but you know, is there an edge? Is there something that you can think of that defenses would do specifically to try to mitigate those changes that, you know, obviously it's tilted in the offense's favor, but what do you do to adjust to that rule change and adjust to be, try to minimize that as much as you can? You know, I think you're seeing a form of that, in the NFL now, and I feel like we adapted that. You know, we went through my last three years at Pulaski Academy where we didn't have – two years, we didn't have a single player on the the team that started on defense over 200 pounds. Now, that sounds crazy. You're looking at defensive line, that kind of stuff. So you want guys that can run to the ball. Well, if your defensive line is right at 200 pounds or 195, what are your linebackers going to be? They're going to be a little smaller but a little faster. So they can help in the pass game. And what are your you and, and you you said something. You said, you know, Napier is focused on the D-backs, the safeties, and and stuff like that. I think you're gonna see one of two things. No more going after a safety that's a big hitter. What does that do? That's gonna get you a penalty. Now, you need one that can run a little faster and get there in time to knock the ball down. And so you're looking for ball skills more than you are big hitter at safety. To the point where maybe now you had a guy that was maybe a little too big for corner, but he's a good cover guy. Now he's your safety because he's a better cover guy. Now what does that do? That changes the way you can play defense. You don't have to play a zone shell anymore. Now you can play man if you've got a better athlete playing safety. You can play one high man or no high man because now you aren't worried about your safety matching up and getting beat. You've got a a corner that's that's on him. And and so I think it changes what defenses can do. I think everything is going to cycle around. Right now the rules dictate – that the offenses were going to improve. I think that over time, defenses are going to get smarter. They're going to start changing the way they're going to do that. Now, the good news, the bad news is those safeties are going to go down the linebackers. Those linebackers are going to go down and be defensive ends that rush the quarterback. And uh, those defensive ends that rush the quarterback probably going to go down to D tackle. You look at Aaron Donald, a smaller defensive lineman, quick, showing how dominant he is in the NFL. What you're going to do is – so I'm sure you're going to foster out the big guys off the defense completely, I think. There will always be a couple that hang on to the run stoppers, but that's where it's going to go. But I think it starts with recruiting from back to front. As far as college goes in the NFL, I already know they're doing some of that. And uh, that's, what's, that's how it's going to cycle back to a defensive side a little bit. So, you know, and, and that's sort of – the scheme aspect of things, but when it comes to the actual analytics or execution during the game, what do you think is the one in-game thing that most coaches get wrong? What's the thing that you think that if they just could, could get a handle on, or, or do you think it's different with different coaches and, and that each of them sort of has to assess their strengths and weaknesses? Yeah. I mean, so some coaches strategy in game strategy on offense or defense is more analytically based. Now, some of it's by sheer accident. It's just what they believe in you know, lays across a good analytic detail that matters in a game the most. Some of it, it's accidental. Uh, I think more and more coaches are trying to gear things towards that. I mean, you know, people look and they go, well, in, in my, and I think in my first, in my first 12 years as a head coach, I think we won three state championships. No, maybe in my first, my first 11 years, we won three state championships. In my last seven, we won six. Now, that didn't happen by accident. I discovered analytics, and, you know, I'm, I think I'm a good football coach. I got a little better every year, but we didn't get drastically that much better. But I went and go, okay, I want to look at analytics and pick out the ones that fit my team the most and that matter in games. And, and I know that those are 20-yard plays, turnovers, but everybody's practicing turnovers. So I kind of eliminated that because I'm not going to be that much better at getting my guy to cause a fumble than that guy is. But – 20-yard plays, I can design plays and teach our quarterback and, and work on that analytics. Um, 
77% of all games in college the year before last were won by whoever had the most sacks. Well, you can go, okay, well, we need to sack the quarterback more. Okay, well, what does that mean? Are you really willing to blitz more to sack the quarterback more? Some teams are scared to blitz. Some coaches are scared to blitz. I just knew that the sack number mattered as much as in, you know, it was like the third most predictive analytic. So, by gosh, we need to design our schemes better, our blitzes better, know when they're going to pass better because that sack is a hugely important thing. We designed our team around that analytic, tackles for loss. Or we will, that was one of the highest things, 67%, I think, of teams that had more tackles for loss win the game. Well, what does that mean? That means on a running down, crowd the box. Don't go too high if you can get a predictive analysis of when they're going to run the ball so you're taking an extra guy out of the box because you're a safe player, you know, you're a safe coach or you're a bend but don't break guy. Those, those don't work analytically. So I guess what I'm saying is those analytics are out there. What I did was pick out the four or five the most that won games and designed our offense and defense around those things. And I think more and more coaches are willing to look for that next answer when they see that it's okay and acceptable to do so. Some coaches were scared to do it at first. Well, I don't want people to think I'm winning because I'm listening to a bunch of computer nerds. You know, that was the old thing in coach speak. And now it's like, people don't care why we're winning. They just want us to win. And so if there's an advantage in that, you know, they'll start looking at that. And I think that's where we, I think that's, where they're getting closer and closer to. Now, Coach, look, looking at the mental side here, uh, you know, dealing with the team that's obviously won, you, you won nine state titles. That's a, that's a lot of winning to focus on it at one time. How do you prevent your teams from riding too high after a win or getting too low after a loss? And really just how do you deal with that expectations year after year? Yeah, and let me go back to the last question. That to answer your question, what is the biggest thing a coach can do? And, I, and I'm taking part of the question and answering it. You know, I don't think there's any substitute for offensive play calling in game is the single biggest equalizer in the game of football. And I, I, I don't, I think there's a lot of decent play callers. I don't think there's a lot of elite play callers. I mean, just that, that can look, and see three steps ahead and remember when we were on this hash and this formation on the boundary, four plays ago, how did they line up? What's their weakness? What can we do to attack that weakness? And, and, and if you ask me, why did you call a play at any moment in the game, I can look at it and tell you exactly why. And it's never going to be because we're really good at running that play. It's going to be because of what they were doing. I think that's the biggest thing coaches can do in game to help their team win and I don't think enough coaches focus on that. And that's a personal opinion. Some people think culture is the biggest thing you can do in game. You know, I think when you get in the game and, and the world's flowing and the, and the adrenaline's flowing, everybody wants to win. Your culture, you know, it, it bleeds over, but not to the point that it matters. If you can call a play that's wide open and give your team a free touchdown, that's a free touchdown. That's a big deal. And so I think that's the biggest thing to answer your question while ago. And if you can base that on a why, oftentimes that's tied to analytics and that'll help. Uh, to go back to this last question you just asked, you know, that's one of the great things about a coach at any level uh, to avoid the highs and lows. I think there's classic letdown games for everybody. And I, I, for me personally, the way to do that was just to be honest. And what I mean by that is I would just go, guys, we came off a big win, a huge win. Some of you even thought we weren't going to win that game. We came off that win. And if you celebrate that too long and we don't get back to work, I promise you it's going to be a letdown game for us. So we talked about the letdown. We made it apparent that that's a real possibility because what do we do? You know, if, if, if I send you off driving in the desert at night with no headlights and don't tell you you're about to drive into the Grand Canyon, you're going to drive into the Grand Canyon. But if I send you driving into the – desert in the middle of the night with no headlights. And I tell you, hey, now once you drive about 15 minutes, start looking because you're going to drive off into the Grand Canyon. If I tell you about it, you're easy, it's easier for you to psychologically avoid that, to physically avoid that. And so I made it prevalent to them. Now, the other thing that I think you can do to avoid letdown game is tell the team that the team about the team you're playing and really what they are. I mean, if we would look to start a season in a 10-game schedule, not knowing who we're going to play in the playoffs, I would look, and, and when we got to a week where we're playing a bad team that wasn't going to beat us, and no, 
there isn't a Friday where anybody can beat anybody. Not true. There are some teams that weren't going to beat us, period. So if I try to build them up the same as I try to build up a team that was the second or third best team in our schedule, eventually my kids are going to see through and go, okay, coach builds them up to make it all look like they can beat us, and they can't. So they don't even listen when I'm really meaningful. You know, maybe a team's played under what they're capable of, but they're talented, and I'm trying to go, these guys can beat you. Well, if every week I'm like, these guys can beat you, they quit believing you. So I was very honest. I'd be like, look, guys, this team can't beat us. We're going to beat them by 50 if we want to. What we want to do is get better at some aspect of the game. This week, we're working on the run game. So even when it looks like we should throw the ball, or we normally would, we're working on our run game because that's what we need to work on before we get the playoff. Real honest, and we worked on something specific. And I think now that takes their mind and focuses it on something hard where you don't have the letdown. And then coming off a letdown, uh, you know, that's what to do off a letdown win off a letdown loss, I talked to him about it. everybody's like, oh, put that one behind you. No, don't put it behind you. Put it back here and use it for motivation. Mm -hmm. Way back in the back of your mind that when it's hot and you're mad and coaches yelling at you or you don't want to watch that extra film, you're like, wait, what did losing feel like last week? Well, that sucked. What can I do to avoid that feeling again? Well, I cannot do that. I can practice a little harder, watch a little bit more film, that kind of thing. So I'm always just hit them right in the face with, the things that people seem to kind of go, put that off on the side. We don't want them to think about a letdown game. I do. I want them to know it's a real possibility. It happens every single week. Go look at any college game where they play their crosstown wide. Go look the next week. You know, and, and, and if you're a better, heck, Vegas builds that into the games. Let down points off of a game, one or, you know, here or there. It's a real thing. And psychologically, you have to take care of it. And I think you just have to slap them right in the face with it and say, this is a real deal. Here's how we have to do to avoid that. Yeah, so, Coach, I'm curious. What's the best thing about being a coach? Like, what, what is the thing that just lights you up when it comes to being a head coach? And and you want you know. the you want the you want the you want the 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 humanitarian answer? Do you want the happiness answer, or do you want the spiritual answer? Because there's three answers. I mean, I, I think I want the honest answer. What's the one that makes you? want to be a coach i'm not gonna answer i like all three of them <laughs> oh, i'm greedy i want all three there you go i was waiting for you to say that Nick. i appreciate that i mean will just leaving me hanging out on a limb hanging off that grand canyon cliff i mean you know um didn't no, even I, warn I, him we got a word of about that I, I, honestly honestly the best the, my, my favorite my Favorite things, they occur in different areas. When you really, when you've got a kid that comes to you after practice, coach, I didn't talk to you. And the kid's got a problem at home or something. And you, and I, and I say kid, whether it's a college kid, a high school kid, an NFL guy, and he needs advice. He's having trouble with his wife or a kid's parents are getting a divorce or he's having a real problem. When you can sit down and spend some quality minutes with them, time with them, and they come back later and go, gosh, thank you, coach, that sir. There's nothing better. I mean, right then, you don't care about anything. It's just, it's so awesome. That's one. Um, another one is, is, is when you make a kid uh, feel really important part of the team that's not a star of the team. Maybe he's not even a starter of the team. But gosh, you can pull up on film, look at this play. You mimic that perfectly in scout team. We wouldn't have made that play. That was the difference maker in the game because you got over there and busted it. And you're not even out there on Friday night. And you make that kid feel really important part of the team. And when you see that he's got it, it's a huge deal. I mean, it's a big deal because that's what team is, you know. And, and that just – it just runs rampant throughout the starters and everybody else that, wow, there's a role for anybody and everybody. And, and all you got to do is be willing to take that role and be proud of it. And I, and I like that. I know that sounds goofy, but it is. And then, you know – as far as just extremely happy, I was really, really blessed to win some state championships. And with all the hard work, and now football's a year-round thing for probably half the team. The other half's probably playing another sport, or at least ours where I wanted them playing other sports. But with all that hard work, you know, the wins on Friday night, and I can't stand it when coaches on Twitter go, anybody that cares a ton about winning in high school football, there's something wrong with you. 
what in the world are we saying that for? You know, that's, that's said by people that don't understand winning's important to people. And if those kids are going to work their tails off all summer and all winter and all week, they deserve the reward of winning. But my favorite thing was at the end of it, if we won a state championship game, the look, I, I immediately, and I got lucky because the first one we won, I, I looked up and saw some kids' faces because I was, I was tough back then. You could be tougher and put the kids through a tough, tough time in the off season. And I looked up and they were all smiling and I saw the faces, the exuberance. And, and so now I like to look at the expressions on the kids' faces when we win that game. And then I walk up and down the sidelines, especially to the ones that I know maybe that kid was thinking about quitting at one time, or maybe he went through something hard during the season that the other kids didn't know about. And I go, was it, I, I literally just walk up to the phone and go, was it all worth it? So I can hear them say, yes, coach, that was all worth it. Because to me, that's going to tell them going forward and everything they do, you're going to go through hard times. It's going to be worth it if you'll persevere and do what you can do. And you'll find that success. It's all worth it. You know, because too many times in life, we find reasons to not finish that. You know, and I've been guilty of that just like everybody else has. But if you can push through Oftentimes there's a reward over there that makes everything you went through worth it. And I want the kids to know it. And maybe that's what makes me feel good about going into the next year and pushing back through it again, myself and them, my family, their families is, is if they can answer me at the end of that thing with that great expression. Yeah, coach, it was all worth it. I loved it. And, and so those are the ones. That's a fantastic answer, coach. That's really good look into the mindset of the coach. We're sitting here talking about numbers and everything else. And, and, you know, focus on the players. That's a, that's a great answer there. Uh, Billy Napier coming down. We, we are Florida Gator centric uh, channel here, coach. So I want to get your impressions of Billy Napier. I mean, that's one thing you hear about Napier and his staff is really their care for people. And that's, that's been a big positive about the players so far. I was, I was wondering what you think uh, seeing Billy Napier from the outside. Have you interacted? Did he come up to Pulaski for a game or two while he was at Louisiana? It wasn't too far away there. Yeah, and you know what? He stayed primarily in Louisiana, and uh, I didn't. I watched him far because I, I, I try to study good coaches, and I think he's an outstanding coach. He maintained a high level in the same conference for a long period of time, was very dominant at times. Uh, I, I know people that know him and know of him. The guys that work for him like to work for him. Uh, the players like to play for him. I think he did still held a, a level of discipline and accountability. I think he's a guy that's got it all kind of figured out, you know, We'll see how much when, – when you move up in position, like he's going to move up into the SEC and be in the limelight, it takes so much of your time. It pulls time that he probably had down in Louisiana. He might not have as much. So there's an adjustment that he'll have to make. I don't know him well enough or know, even know of him well enough to how, know how well he'll make that adjustment. But if he does, the coaching part, the people person part, the accountability part, the communication part, from this perspective – He's going to do really well, and I think Florida got a great football coach, and uh, I think he's a guy that coaches his coaches and manages that staff well, and uh, I think that's what Florida needs because we all know they're going to get good talent. It's a great place to play football. They've got a storied tradition, and I think everybody there wants to get back to what they used to be, and that's you know competing for a national championship. Well, I mean, from that perspective, I think the the uh, the only question I have left is, what advice would you give to folks who want to get into football as a career? Like, what what would you say they need to do in order to get into the sport that everybody loves and everybody wants to wants to be involved in? Get into it for the right reason. You know, I I, I did real. You know, I was at the smallest school in Division One. There's 973 students in college, in the whole college. Now, I mean, that's smaller than most high schools. And I'm not condemning that. What I'm saying is whenever I took the job, I bet I got at least 500 emails, phone calls, asking to come work there for free. Okay. People wanted to get in the college game. Now they didn't want to get in the college game to get in the college. They, well, they wanted to, because at the, at the end of that college rainbow is a pot of gold. There's a lot of money. It is so few the people are there going to make that and make that ton of money but there's so many people getting into it because they love football. Now I don't doubt they love football, but they want to make that money. You can't get into it for that. Cause you're not going to be one of those ones. I mean, the probability is such that you're not going to go back to numbers, 
I mean, you, you've got a 99% chance you're never going to be that or more. And you got to get into it for the right reason. You love the game. You love what it did for you. That's a good reason. You want to find a way and you can acclimate yourself to be a football coach and a counselor. That's a good reason, you know, to get in. And then work your butt off and see what happens. But you better get into it for the right reason because, and you got to know this, like any job, like any job, 90% of what you do isn't going to be what you thought you signed up for. Just 10% of it is. You better be willing to take on that other 90% that's going to come along with it. And some of it isn't very fun. And you got to be able to balance family. You got to be able to balance that. And you got to, you got to be able to prioritize right. But at the same time, you better know how to deal with failure because it's going to come and it's going to come in a public spotlight. If I'm a bad uh, mail delivery carrier and I stick a couple of letters in the wrong mailbox, America doesn't know, my community doesn't know, and only people that care are the person that I stuck their mail in the wrong box. You call the wrong play, go for it on fourth down at the wrong time, the whole community is up there and they know in high school, in college, 90,000 people know, and social media is going to go wild. You have to know how to accept, how to accept failure and to keep moving forward. And, and, uh, and it's tough for you sometimes. You know, I haven't always handled that myself as well as I should have. And, and uh, all you can do is learn from that and move on. But if you're not willing to do all those things I talked about, football is not the game for you. And you've got to do a sport, go into, you know, pickleball or something where nobody's watching and nobody cares, you know, and, and I hate to say that, but that's, that's what you need to do because you're in the spotlight, whether you want to be, and everybody thinks they want to be until you're in it. And then you just wish to God, nobody was paying attention. You just want to coach ball and deal with your players. Hey coach, I, I live in, uh, I live outside of Tampa, Florida. I can assure you a whole lot of people over 60 care about pickleball. I can. I care you. about pickleball. I said it because I took it up last month. I love the sport. Are you playing? But nobody. But nobody's watching us play, right. you know. I mean, there's not a crowd of 90,000 in, in Tuscaloosa, Alabama watching us play pickleball. But, yeah, I'm playing. I love it. Absolutely love it. Yeah, I'm a racquetball player. I get it. I get it. Nobody yeah, cares. Yeah. So, yeah. Hey, Coach, you, you kind of referenced there. You're thinking about uh, potential maybe back to high school, maybe another college, maybe going to business outside of football. Is this just a point where you're just t- stepping back and just taking a breath and going to figure out the next step here? in the next few months, or is it just, you, you definitely, it's going to take the season off from coaching or, or how's that go? Do we need to get in touch with Billy Napier to get you down to Gainesville or what? <laughs> you know, it, 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 now I'm at a, a position where, you know, I've had a good run in football. I love football. Uh, if it's the right place, right person, you know, I'd work for, I want to work for a good man. I work for somebody who believes in what I do and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to work for an NFL team, did that for a few days. I realized I wasn't going to be able to watch my daughter graduate high school. And so, you know, I, that, that was, that played a big factor in me to, you know, leaving. I got a call from NFL team yesterday, you know, and, and talked on the analytics side of it and you know, we're gauging some interest there. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but part of me wants to go into the business world and do something and find something to work with people. But at the same time, you know, if I, play, if I coach high school football, I know here's my salary, whether I work 16 hours a day or 12 hours a day. Mm-hmm. You go into business a lot of time, if you're willing to work 16 hours a day, you make a little more money than if you work eight hours a day. And, 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 and I'd kind of like to do that. And then instead of giving my time and myself back, you know, be able to give money and, 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 and help people that way and foundations and, you know, missionaries, that kind of stuff. And, and don't get me wrong, I want to be able to do some things that I want to do, you know. I, I don't need to live extravagantly, but I want to be able to go on a vacation when I want to and that kind of stuff. So I'm going to, I'm going to figure it out, but I either want to do something I really want to do in the business world or, you know, uh, work for the right man, you know, whoever that is and, and however that is. Well, coach, we really appreciate you taking the time out to join us. Um, I would, I would love if we can keep bugging you about football questions because it's fascinating talking to you here. Will, you got any final words before we sign off? I no, just really appreciate it, Coach. Appreciate the insight and uh, appreciate you taking the time. Always a pleasure, guys. Got, uh, glad to see you're still up and running. And uh, hopefully you guys have a good uh, college football season to talk about. I know that makes it better than, than, than the negativity that comes with it when you, when you have a bad one. So, uh, so good luck to you guys. <laughs> Coach, we got Utah and Kentucky out the gate. We're going to know quick. <laughs> yeah, you will. You will. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining the show tonight. Appreciate the time and go Gators.